Hello, my name is Jennifer Cozart. I'm a cardiovascular surgeon at the Texas Heart Institute in Houston, Texas, and it's an honor to speak for the Women's Symposium today. I'll be discussing atrial fibrillation and the new approaches in management of this common disease, and I have no disclosures. AFib is the most common cardiac arrhythmia worldwide, and it affects more than 3 million people in the U.S. alone. AFib is associated with increased risk of thromboembolic events like stroke, peripheral ischemia, also reduced quality of life, and increased mortality. Persistent AFib is a significant treatment challenge due, the, due to the electrical and anatomic differences among patients, and this talk will focus uh, on this form of AFib. AFib is less common in women, but women experience more symptoms, complications, and worse overall quality of life compared to men. Uh, women with AFib also have an increased risk of stroke, heart attack, and increased mortality. Therefore, we may need to be more aggressive in treatment of AFib in women specifically. Um, there are several different types of AFib I want to quickly define. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is AFib that resolves within seven days of onset. I'm going to be speaking on treatments which target patients with non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and the two types are persistent, which is consistent AFib sustained more than seven days, and long-standing persistent, which is continuous AFib more than 12 months. This is an important slide that sums up most of what we need to know about AFib. Uh, the AFib risk factors shown here on the left induce structural changes to the atrium that then lead to fibrosis, inflammation, and cellular changes. These changes then increase the susceptibility to more AFib. Uh, persistent AFib then further induces electrical and structural remodeling that promotes more AFib. Th hence the term AFib begets AFib. Uh, AFib may also lead to the development of additional risk factors that further alter the atrial tissue substrate. Finally, AFib is associated with several adverse clinical outcomes like stroke, heart attack, dementia, CHF, and thromboembolism. And this slide shows why managing AFib or restoring normal sinus rhythm is very important. And the earlier we treat this or slow the progression, the better. When you think of AFib, you should think of stroke. Uh, an irregular rhythm causes stasis of the blood in the atrium and formation of thrombus and that most commonly happens in the left atrial appendage, uh, and then that clot can embolize uh, into, into the systemic circulation and end up lodged in the brain causing a stroke. AFib increases the risk of stroke fivefold, and strokes related to AFib are typically more severe than those uh, not caused by AFib. Primary treatment for AFib is medical treatment with rate or rhythm control and anticoagulation, but current research favors early procedural interventions to restore normal sinus rhythm and reduce AFib progression and complications. The procedural treatments for AFib consist of endocardial ablation, which is done by an electrophysiologist, and we know this is good treatment for paroxysmal AFib, but it's difficult to treat persistent and long-standing persistent AFib with this technique alone. The techniques I'll cover more uh, today involve surgery. Uh, traditional AFib surgery consists of the Cox Maze procedure, which is still the gold standard of surgical treatment for AFib. It can be technically challenging and complex, and it does require cardiopulmonary bypass. It can be done uh, through an open sternotomy or also minimal access. It does have a high long-term success rate at over 85% success at five years. Hybrid procedures are newer techniques, which are a multidisciplinary approach combining both endocardial and epicardial ablation, which is both a surgical and an electrophysiology uh, procedure, and it provides maximal treatment through minimally invasive off-pump approaches. Uh, closure of the left atrial appendage is also a very important component in treatment of AFib and stroke prevention and can be done with other cardiac surgeries or as a standalone procedure. Uh, surgical treatment of AFib was first performed over 25 years ago by Dr. James Cox in 1987. And this di diagram shows the traditional cut and sew Cox Maze 3 procedure, which is the basis of all ablations for AFib and remains the gold standard treatment for chronic atrial fibrillation. The full Cox Maze lesion set is highly effective and it results in a high success rate, but it's rarely used today due, it, due to its high complexity. And this technique involved making multiple left and right atrial incisions and sewing them back together. And and that then formed a set of scars which isolated the pulmonary veins, posterior left atrium, and the right atrium. The maze pattern was chosen to prevent uh, multiple radical impulses uh, from causing AFib, but also leaving the ability to activate both atria in normal sinus rhythm. 
This slide shows the lesions for the Cox Maze 4, which is a newer version of the Cox Maze 3, and it uses a combination of incisions and alternate energy sources like bipolar radiofrequency and cryoablations, and those uh, devices are shown to the right, uh, and they're used to complete the full lesion set of the Cox Maze 4. Uh, this uh, makes an easier, quicker, and safer operation with the same end goal uh, instead of using all incision lines as in the Cox Maze 3. This can be performed minimally invasive or through an open chest. It does require cardiopulmonary bypass and cardiac arrest. It can be done alone or with other cardiac procedures as well. And I'm showing this image as the lesion lines here are the basis for hybrid management of AFib, which I'm going to discuss. So hybrid ablations for AFib are a collaborative effort between an electrophysiologist and a cardiac surgeon to produce a complementary lesion set on the heart, both inside, which are endocardial ablations, and outside the heart, which are epicardial ablations. And combining the two approaches as a hybrid treatment, it's possible to replicate most of the Cox maze 4 lesions without cardiopulmonary bypass, which is a great advantage. And these off-pump, hybrid, minimally invasive procedures are much more appealing to patients and also referring doctors. And the types of hybrid ablations I'll speak about are the convergent approach or convergent plus and hybrid totally thoracoscopic maze. In 2021, the Episense radiofrequency device, which is the device used for the convergent approach, was uh, approved by the FDA for treatment of long-standing persistent AFib. And this hybrid convergent approach is a team effort, again, with EP and uh, cardiac surgeon. It consists of two procedures staged four to six weeks apart. The first part's a surgical epicardial or outside the heart ablation with or without left atrial appendage closure. And the second part's an endocardial or inside the heart mapping and ablation by an electrophysiologist. The two targeted patient groups for the convergent ablation are those with long-standing persistent AFib or AFib more than a year, and those with persistent AFib who have recurred after failed uh, endocardial ablations. So just going through the uh, surgical procedure, uh, convergent ablation begins uh, with a transesophageal echocardiogram in the operating room to rule out any left atrial thrombus. If a thrombus is seen in the, in the heart, then the case is aborted due to the risk of embolization and stroke. If the heart is clear, then we proceed with the surgery. A subxiphoid pericardial window incision is performed and a cannula with a thoracoscope is placed in the posterior pericardium behind the heart. This video shows the surgical procedure. Through the cannula and the subxiphoid window, the scope and epicense radiofrequency device is inserted into the posterior pericardium. The device then creates multiple three centimeter linear radiofrequency ablation lines to completely cover the posterior left atrial wall between the pulmonary veins. One great benefit of this approach is that the ablation energy is directed away from the esophagus and directly toward the heart, which decreases the chance of esophageal injury. Four weeks later, the endocardial mapping and catheter ablation is then done by the electrophysiologist to treat any gaps in the ablation lines or areas that weren't able to be reached by the first part uh, epicardial approach. The completed lesion set for the convergent approach is shown here. The blue uh, represents the epicardial or outside of the heart lesions that are done by surgery, and red are the endocardial lesions inside the heart which are done uh, for completion by the electrophysiologist. And the goal is debulking of the tissue that mostly uh, commonly causes atrial fibrillation, and the entire posterior left atrial wall should be ablated. The end result is equivalent to the box lesion set from the Cox maze procedure with left atrial posterior wall and pulmonary vein isolation. In March 2021, the results of the Converge trial were published, uh, and it was a prospective multi-center randomized clinical control trial that demonstrated improved effectiveness of the hybrid convergent procedure over traditional endocardial ablation alone, uh, especially in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. The Converge trial was conducted in 27 sites in the U.S. and the U.K., studied 153 patients with drug refractory, symptomatic persistent, and long-standing persistent AFib. Uh, the patients were randomized two to one into the hybrid convergent arm and the endocardial catheter ablation uh, alone. Uh, the left atrial appendage of note was not closed by any technique in this study. Uh, and the patients in this study had no prior ablations, uh, so they had um, uh, no prior uh, interventional treatment to their heart. Uh, the converged trial imposed no limits on the duration of atrial fibrillation and it also allowed patients with substantial left atrial dilation, which made it the only ablation trial to date which included patients with long-standing persistent AFib and those with significant comorbid conditions. Um, the long-standing persistent AFib sub-analysis set showed excellent results and led to the FDA label in 2021 for treatment of long-standing persistent uh, AFib with this technique. Uh, 
Uh, 42% of the patients in this trial had long-standing persistent AFib, uh, and I'm going to show those results now. Freedom from AFib and at least 90% AFib burden reduction was significantly better with the convergent versus endocardial ablation alone, and this was sustained through 18 months. The diagram on the left shows that 71% of the patients in the hybrid group had AFib freedom at 12 months compared to 51% in patients with catheter ablation. At 18 months, this was sustained. So the absolute success difference of 20% is st statistically significant in favor of the hybrid convergent group. Convergent Patients also had 71% freedom from cardioversion compared to 41% freedom in endocardial catheter ablation alone at 12 months. And this graph shows that the AFib symptoms like palpitations, shortness of breath, and fatigue were significantly reduced after convergent ablation from baseline. So the dark bars show um, how much uh, symptoms they had before the procedure and at 12 months after the procedure, um, the lighter bars show significant reduction of those symptoms. So the results of the converged trial showed superior outcomes of the hybrid convergent procedure when compared to endocardial catheter ablation alone with drug refractory long-standing persistent AFib. The, these results were sustained at 18 months and there was a significant reduction in AFib symptoms reported by patients. So the convergent approach is, has, was also proven to be safe uh, and a collaborative heart team approach helps to improve outcomes in difficult to treat patients with advanced AFib. The Convergent Plus approach, which is what I personally perform in my practice, is gaining popularity and it produces further optimization against AFib. It includes the previously described Convergent approach, but it also adds a left thoracoscopy with epicardial closure of the left atrial appendage using a clip. Uh, the ligament of Marshall can also be divided, which is a structure thought to be important in AFib, and uh, an additional ablation line uh, on the left atrial roof, anterior to the left pulmonary veins, and at the base of the left atrial appendage can also be added. The hybrid totally thoracoscopic maze is a newer minimally invasive technique for AFib that's more comprehensive than the convergent approach, but it is more complex. This diagram outlines the lesions which create the full Cox maze four lesion set through an off-pump minimally invasive technique. It does require a bilateral thoracoscopic approach uh, to create uh, the biatrial epicardial lesions. The left atrial appendage is also closed using a clip device, and the second stage endocardial catheter mapping and ablation is also performed to complete the lesion set similar to the convergent approach. Uh, a recent series published from the group in Chicago, uh, from including Pat McCarthy and Dr. Cox, reported excellent results with a totally thoracoscopic maze, with result, results showing one-year freedom from AFib off antiarrhythmic drugs of 85%. And this procedure is not done in many centers currently due to its complexity, but I do expect that it will be further adopted in the future as the technique is refined. I just want to mention that left atrial appendage closure should also be an integral part of any AFib treatment because it reduces the arrhythmia burden and also prevents stroke and thromboembolism. And these images show the epicardial closure device. Um, approximately uh, or over 300,000 of these uh, have been used worldwide and it's very safe and effective. Uh, this can be surgically placed either through open surgery with other uh, cardiac procedures or through a minimally invasive approach. And um, it can also be done as a standalone approach in patients who can't tolerate um, blood thinners uh, through a minimally invasive left chest approach. I prefer this method of closing the left atrial appendage versus an endocardial plug uh, because it electrically isolates left atrial appendage, uh, which further reduces AFib burden by approximately an extra 10%. So in conclusion, non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation can be successfully and safely treated with minimally invasive hybrid procedures. You should always consider left atrial appendage closure during any hybrid treatment or concomitant cardiac surgery in patients with AFib or as a standalone procedure when indicated. A hybrid team approach is an excellent way to optimize treatment and reduce the complications associated with AFib. Uh, new and emerging techniques are safe and effective for treating AFib and should be considered, especially for patients with long-standing AFib. And I want to sincerely thank the Texas Heart Institute for the opportunity to speak with you today. Enjoy the rest of the conference.